Hello everyone, today we address the shift in medieval mm, philosophy, mm, canonistics and military theory from the use in bello to the use ad bellum. Actually we will make another video explaining the use in bello we already made uh, actually uh, multiple videos on for example the you know peni penitence in early medieval Europe uh, regarding bloodshed how you know the the idea of, of just war also during you know the, the 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 crusades was more refined at a theoretical level we explained naturally not to you know ever lose the the broader um ethical background and context in which the these concepts were being expressed which is um uh, done very often in a secularizing uh, modernizing i'd say secularistic modernistic better way whenever we talk about you know the Middle Ages as if, you know, these emerged as a thing on its own and they didn't come from certain important branches of, you know, moral uh, dimension and intensity that had always been there and had already reflected in a concept of war. And the uh, the, 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 the shift in, in um, let's say, in high medieval times is to the use of bellum. So, so in, in the way war had, not, not much anymore, whether war had to be fought or not, right? But how war had to be fought in a moral sense, in an ethical um, sense. So um, this is an important concept because it reflects uh, itself uh, very much on uh, how we still think about certain things. You, you could trace uh, a fil rouge uh, without too, too much uh, approximation from from these times in literature we will be listing essentially the main authors and such um, uh, their, their works regarding to, to the topic um, to the the Geneva conventions uh, in the 19th and 20th century so um, because what what is important for especially the military historian uh, is to understand whether these uh, and it's, that's another big point whether these mm, theories, mm, whichever they were, I mean, how they were expressed, from which background, which, which literary style, they often overlapped also with other uh, literary genres, as it is, it's interesting to read them by, by a certain degree as well. And there were many, right, they didn't just stop in the Middle Ages, in fact, uh, they, they, as we will see, they, they, they kept increasing up to the 18th century, and th that's not just a random time, uh, were actually applied in reality, that is, what was the military reality, right, we make a lot of effort to, to discover that, to reconstruct that, and there is all a debate that I, you know, I also wrote about sometimes uh, regarding the, the obvious distance that exists between these precepts and, re and, and, uh, and the reality of war, but not in the, again, in the hypocritical sense that we're usually brought to think these things up, but actually um, which m very often um, highlights our our simplification we are used to as modern people um, uh, to you know framing you know complex um, complex systems and analyzing them, but rather understanding exactly first of all what they meant by those precepts in a sense and 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 what war really was and how they intertwined, and they did deeply in ways that should not make us discount what properly the the meaning of such works was and, and naturally not all who wrote about such things were actually men of war um, but uh, there is all a change uh, in, in the pattern of these works that does reflect uh, and mirrors without you know unsurprisingly let's say the actual political and social and, and consequently military developments of the time by scale uh, passing from, if you want, this individual dimension, like from the penitential, still mirroring that kind of simple, if you want, early medieval idea, almost, you know, it's, it's, it's legalistic, right? And, you know, how much uh, had you sinned? You know, it was literally a quantity of things you had to do to, uh, together with contrition, of course, and, and so on, to uh, repentance, to, to fix that. And two, instead, uh, late medieval times were basically gets into something like more uh, you know international law in a certain sense for for the sovereigns from the princes that were compacting their 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 politics consistently in a subtle direction at the time um 
So, an important shift already uh, evident from the use in Bedlam to the use at Bedlam could be seen, for example, with at the times of the establishment of the uh, religious military orders, right? Uh, as in fact seemed already to the uh, to the deep theologian and in answer of the same Bernard of Clairvaux uh, regarding a spiritualization and a sort of perfecting uh, of the chivalric ideals um, that um, in, uh, in in lay chivalry as it was uh, the, said the militia who use secularly remained instead uh, threatened in a sense by the boastfulness by the temptation of the senses and so on there there is an important distinction because um, there is fundamentally the idea that that the full devotion to the ideal so that the full moral commitment to the cause uh, that of course had to be uh, had already been defined as a just one oh, by uh, long before uh, was in a sense what was still what, what would make the difference in absolute terms St. Bernard saw so, so it in, in, a, in a very functional sense and from a literally monastic perspective where, you know, the, the, the monastery was meant to reflect the perfection of the heavenly uh, Jerusalem on earth and it didn't actually ha had to be an, an uh, hermitism, let's say. It had to properly be out there in the world. The monks had to interact with the world um, so much in the case of the knights. So here you see... Uh, that that existed at all levels of society to in theory make of the whole world such such uh, heavenly Jerusalem right which is what uh, uh, let's say helped like it may seem sound like a utopia but again it's not very different from the a Clausewitzian concept of uh, total war and you know moral forces applied to that in an asymptotic sense to say okay yes we cannot reach that but the in order to to be effective from a political military point of view, we should literally think that that's the direction. And it, if we take another direction, we go astray. And the, and, and this was done by criticizing the, the morals of the secular of the time, as we can always do, right? In every time in history, just because we're never we're, ne we're never going to be perfect, not meant to be, whatever that means. Uh, but we should tend towards the truth. And so this absolutely uh, you know anti-relativistic um, stance that is a challenge to properly mature but that is what makes concretely things done and commits morally to to the cause and as we've seen in the videos we made on the monastic military orders just recently we made one of the Templar Knights that was actually the only difference existing between between a, a knight monk and, and another knight. That is to say, exteriorly, they were literally the same identical thing. There was no, no military difference of any sort, of any kind. The only difference, as always, is the moral dimension. is how much they were committed. And then the, 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 these knights were uh, conceived, even doctrinally, in, in an anachronistic term, to literally take down so many before just killing being killed because it was either victory or, or defeat and naturally also in that uh, in that stance that you know they, they wouldn't literally behave quite all like that but the, the the idea was that these were very competent people very elite very because they were fully devoted to the cause in the military service in the order and differently from secular knights that had literally other things to think about and to make a world mm, to work uh, even if in its greater imperfection but let's say still uh, it was understood at this point, and this is the the, the idea, that um, the military instrument had to be perfected as such, right? And it, it's very close to its in nature, the understanding of how the moral force would make the difference. So we already notice here, by the time of the Crusades, how uh, independently from whether it was lay or monastic, uh, chivalry shifted the pro the ethical canonistic problem of war from the use in bello to the use at bello so it wasn't much about the causes of war and therefore the justification of the same in line of principle but rather the behavior that you had to to have during its uh, ca you know its, its development its unfolding its carrying out and you immediately understand here that it was a step ahead in the in the in the path of civilization, 
right? Because that would be properly even at some other level. But here it was already understood within Christian world that um, war was not truly really an option, right? This is something that civilization had already been understood very early on. I mean, you know, for, for most people in the past, war was basically the only the only reason for which they they existed in a sense of, you know, ethical code and, you know, what the, the religious view of the thing, the universal view of the world. Well, this world was still like that, right? But it was essentially trying to regulate it in a more refined way, right? As this was a, a more developed world, right? That was also separating much more evenly the, the, various, the various functions, the various branches. Like, you know, knights at this point were becoming just properly that, Right, and the rest of society was articulating in a more complex fashion. So it was understood that pretending to eliminate war as a you know Platonic ideal, as those things dominated in, in the early Middle Ages, not really eliminating it either, because there wasn't anything like that. Right, you know, it's just that the Christian morals didn't see that as as a name, um, and Christianity was pacific, not pacifistic. Uh, there had already been a sort of, of justification since, ever since the Christianization of the Roman Empire. So when, when Christianity came, at, you know, to, to be the the moral backbone of a, of a state, to um, that, but still permeated with the other ideals that existed before. And th that, of course, war was that it was a just war, such as the one of defending the, the empire, the state from from external enemies. Uh, that that is a war that, of course, is more spiritual. Um, let's say is spiritual before uh, material in, in a sense, but that absolutely you know the two things cannot exclude the one or the other. Otherwise, it would have been kind of a uh, you know a gnostic heresy in, in a sense. And um, it uh, it's always both, right? It's always the spirit and the matter, and that's what we're we're given. And um, so that kind of asceticism and platonic tendencies that had remained even during the early Middle Ages were s still reminiscent of, of an idea that went so beyond at a, at a, at a spiritual dimension that it, that's the, the message of Christianity, as radical as it is, that may, may uh, seem for, the, for those who really do not study the Bible as a, you know, as a, as a, a piece of very sophisticated, very refined philosophy, that... That that the ultimate cause should be so totalizing that you shouldn't quite even care about anything else, right? Just like those knights that wouldn't even have to care about their own mortality because that was not their own aim, right? And this was true actually also in the in in in, in the pagan world, right? At least in some specific culture, there, there, there was a, a much greater sense of the idea that uh, it was all about, in fact, this spirit, this moral dimension that albeit connected with with the world was was uh, still to be considered in absolute terms the most important thing so nobody had really invented anything um, uh, new by, by medieval times um, and this was just essentially a functionalization of a concept you know for for th those monarchic states who were forming during the high the low middle ages so later on in the last two centuries let's say of the middle ages when we are in a in a in a different uh, temper, essentially, than in a, uh, if you want, a, a humanistic and pre-modern idea, right? The, the, there is uh, the, the spread of a, but also a moment of crisis, by the way, uh, especially in the first period, um, a, a very thick uh, treatise production that uh, from one side is juridical, from another side it's ethical, literary, strictly man, uh, that began to codify uh, the, the various aspects of war, so that's regulating it in, in a certain sense. So, given the, you know, the 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 idea that after all, there, there could be, um, 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 if you want a, a more pragmatic, it's a, that's what gradually the world was desecularizing, but still, you know, naturally soaked in a old in, in a Christian perspective, how war had to be waged, uh, how you know that the the idea that everybody could really participate to, to this debate by bringing some evidence, by creating a more, let's say, um, uh, technical way, if you want, to, to approach the matter, right? As uh, most people wouldn't quite have the, the broader um, 
you know education for understanding concretely what what the the purpose the you know, like kind of a in fact what what, what I called myself a close of its in mentality and literum could really be right and this is a topic that I'm developing ultimately in my videos and I uh, I will have I will explain especially um, in, in some ones because it, I think it's an important I made one on on the Fortuna Kaiseris recently that explains what what that means like transposing the understanding of a clause of its end concept which is a universal one so it's literally how war has always been right in the properly in the rationalization the, the acknowledgement and ra um, and uh, rationalistic expression of the same right by modern time but that um, was if you want being approached from from different ways already at this point making the first steps in a systematic scientific direction very first steps um, so it's actually a very long literature, a very wide one. Um, they, 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 sometimes it's it's a, they are technical manuals. Sometimes they are novels, or meditations with uh, an allegorical moral background. So as you understand, it's very varied. And at, at the end of the 14th century, for example, Jean de Vignette uh, translated in French under the complex title of um, Enseignement. Et ordonnance pour un seigneur qui a guerre et grand gouvernement à faire. Um, a treatise written in Greek and eventually translated in Latin around 1327 uh, by Theodore Palaiologos uh, of Montferrat, right? had come to, to Western Europe um, and bring in this other, you know, th this earlier literature, as, as a matter of fact, and the title being Teachings and ordinances for for a lord who has to make war and great government so this this aspect is very interesting because um, it came out by the way uh, through you know true two realities were like uh, essentially Italy and France in this in this case with this pinch of Byzantine uh, 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 properly flavor to it um, from from the, the paleology like that um, that was that were heading fast towards a process of statalization. So what do they talk about? Do they talk about you know what the, the individual knight should feel like? No, obviously they talk about a lord. They talk about somebody who is really not a lord. You know, in of high medieval times anymore, like in a modern Bailey castle, right? With a with a you know small scope of it. No, we're talking about states, very powerful ones, big ones that can mobilize tens of thousands of men on the field um, and that have deep international involvement so it's interesting that here the again if you want the closets and instrumental dichotomy between uh, politics and war is is brought in because this is not just teaching how make war but this is teaching how make great government big government whatever he, he meant in that, specifically in that sense uh, but stressing semantically the concept that that great government uh, government w was a big deal at that point, and so it was obviously related to war, which is absolutely correct. In 1360, an Italian jurist, uh, Giovanni da Legnano, had composed a juridical treatise uh, in, in Latin entitled De Bello de, Repre um, de Represalis et de Duello, right? So, um, it, uh, on war of the reprisals, literally, and of duel, um, that the uh, Benedictine and jurist Honorable Beauvais, Beauvais uh, used massively for the composition of his m m famous manual of um, of military law of, of, of yeah of war law entitled L'Arbre de Bataille, uh, drafted towards the 1386 87. Uh, then in the uh, in 14 Tent, the very famous um, Christine de Pizan, who was you know, a Venetian noble woman, uh, naturalized French. The Livre des Faits d'Armes et de Chevalerie. Mm -hmm. um, where she was using Vegetius, right? It, as you know, basically was the only uh, military treatise uh, circulating in Western Europe for, in fact, for throughout all the Middle Ages. And that had always accompanied there the the, the, the military, you know, the reflection of warfare. Uh, even in 
you know, unsuspectable times. Like even Carolingian counts, at least, you know, very few ones that could read or etc. But still in certain contexts still read the Genesis and they they thought highly but not and there is in fact a literature about this that I have been working with that tend that I and I criticized because it tends to practically um uh, Ask uh, or reduce, if you want, the the whether uh, whether the the the, the, the I mean, Vegetius could have literally told medievals how to make war, right? Which and the answer is obviously not, right? I've I've seen literally some revered scholars uh, treating warfare that uh, claiming that I don't know just because there was a correspondence in Vegetius of something that I don't know Chronicle said about a battle or something that they thought that. That system, as complex as it was and as developed as it was by that time, it is, you know, by the 14th century, was it, but that did the same is valid for before, had anything to do with what a late Roman author who himself claimed to basically know nothing about uh, the art of war per se, um, had could have anything to do with it. This has to wake up people properly on how we uh, we approach even scientifically these works because that's wrong. And that's why I, I lament all the time the collapse of academic quality at this point for for so many reasons. Because I believe that a person who studies war, I mean that 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 can arrive to such a con concept and making it a point without, for example, even studying those same campaigns and battles to to see how they by default these armies operated by the way at the time uh, that revealed an, an incredibly developed military organization could could even remotely have to do positive something to do with the Vegetus. Of course, Vegetus was read and it was appreciated. And, and there was surely even somebody who, who said, you know, I've read this thing in Vegetus, let's try it out. But let's say how you can, in, in the sources, connect the thing um, or thinking that that the, the, the massive political and social and military dynamics that, that stood between those things could bring people to literally, uh, you know, Make it on on a on a positive or or, or in, even relevantly systematic way. It's something that you know perplexes me uh, a lot, to say the least. Um, and uh, the same could be. I don't know. We some years ago we made, for example, a a, a video on the the battle plans of uh, the Burgundian or ordinances of of Charles the Bold, and we have seen. Uh, in that case, there, were the, there is all this uh, very refined and somewhat even too sophisticated battle array that should have been that, that, that was planned, you know, with some some months before, uh, in 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 some ways how the armies, the, the Burgundian armies, would have had to be arrayed normally. And we know from simply battle accounts that it wasn't like that, and that of course that these were kind of not necessarily divertissement, but it was a way to reflect on the value of the various arms and so on, but they didn't have quite the practical application that we intend. Also because we know, having studied just um, uh, Montecuccoli from um, Prince Eugene from Clausewitz, all that, let's say, chain, uh, you know, Frederick, the same, here I am not going in chronological order, but seeing how fundamentally a, a, a real positive treatise of, of the art of war starts Concretely, from the second half of the 17th century, right? That it's not even there a random time in history, because there there is properly a scientificity that comes on the fore in a certain de level of development of, of states, etc., that needs to, to pass to, to a more doctrinal idea, because there are, you know, important national armies being born. There, are, there is a greater sale of capacity, and that fulfill complete fulfillment is from Clausewitz at the beginning of the 19th century. You can understand that by medieval times. Such thing was obviously, the, the you know was was unaccomplished, right? The, the first treatises properly on on the art of war, how things had to be properly done, were were here. It's it's not the prehistory because they were literally written, but if if they they had to had any consistency in a, a systemic scientific form, well, you would have to wait for the the early the, you know the early 16th century, right? With what we call modernity, you know. In a narrower sense, at least, to the to the era, uh, and obviously enough, during the Middle Ages, there wasn't a Vegetus to had to teach pe you know people like, but but also in late Roman times, as much as in medieval times, how how war was to be made. Also because it was done so so systematically, so frequently, not every once in a while, and who who has studied medieval 
warfare knows that. I mean, medieval warfare for real, right? Uh, that it doesn't make any sense, right? A, a little digression, and I stop on on the fact that literally sometimes w why is it important to study military history in a diachronic and um, comparative way? Because without that, you cannot properly even understand how often they made war. Right, if you think at Middle Ages as a strip, because most people are brought into the Middle Ages like anecdotally, right? There is this and that, there's this kind of topoi of pictures, of roles, of settings, etc. And and people don't obviously study the sources or real history uh, for even just what a manual could could show you satisfactorily. Not all manuals give you that, but still, uh, in a in a better way that the the one popular culture reverberates even through certain activities of you know re reenactment or thing, things like that it, properly the, the concreteness of, of the fact that you know war was not again happening every once in a while like today if not even today it happens really every once in a while because all our countries are actually fighting somewhere at this point and even if they don't tell us because that's normal that's what you know such big countries do normally uh, and it's perfectly fine by the way unless you know politically speaking there's something you know wrong about that but it's not about war uh, in medieval times war was normal in the sense that it was just an activity that they made virtually every year and if they weren't the community that made war the, the, the ones you know few tens of kilometers away would do and they were always you know very uh, you know uh, aware of what, what, what was going on around that they would have always been sucked in you know sooner or later in some other war uh, there was a you know there were studies that show how I don't know I think it was for 14th century France had a higher degree of militarization in terms of properly people normally participating to military activity independently from professionalism and so on than the Prussia of Frederick II of Hohenzollern. So that tells you how habitual war was really because these were more unstable systems where war was just mm, absolutely normal. We are as moderns, especially after World War II, basically traumatized and after Vietnam, after so I don't think the, 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 from the concept of properly making war that is is quite disturbing you know, and objectively mirroring the the, the collapse of not of moral responsibility but also of, of civic education and democratic culture that fall uh, follows fr from properly uh you know rejecting ideo ideologically the connection between politics and war as a just as as a constant option not the fact it should be making war all the time but only when it serves well if you study medieval warfare you know that they fought because there were consistent reasons for fighting because literally it was easier sometimes to do that than to do so many other things and there was nothing, let's say, morally rigged in the way we intend, right? Just because they made a lot of war. But that's what we have been taught ever since uh, we are little. War is wrong. Yes, so even wars of liberation or resistance or whatever you know, are wrong. That, that was a lie, right? And if you study these, um, you know, if you study warfare in general because this can be applied to, to basically almost to any reality um, you realize that this, especially the, the when war was more endemic in because of the obvious instability of the systems there was not really even an option right there was an option always of course but it, the war was so systemic and, and, and that the you know the, the the option was just whether fighting before or after Right, and it, you you were confronted with it in a way that you couldn't really escape. So um, understanding these points is, is, in my opinion, very, very crucial. But going back to our list, we could name finally for the uh, 70s of the 15th century, uh, Jean de Bouille, who wrote that famous Le Jeuvencel, that Marc Bloch considered as one of the uh, most intelligent uh, novel treatises of, of chivalry of the whole Middle Ages, right? And uh, to be honest, I, I must tell you is that whenever I read treatises of, of such a time, it, it they're not they're not easy reads, right? They're they're boring sometimes, at least they because not again because they're they're actually unintelligent things but on the country because we don't have m most of the background to understand properly what they meant and I'm not an expert on them but otherwise I think it would, they would they're very interesting to to study uh, exactly to find the, the aforementioned connection between theory and practice this is at least you know what there was for sure right 
And um, this literature, as we've seen before, for example, with uh, Giovanni di Legnano, um, was not merely, uh, you know, f f in fact, literature. They, they were juridical texts. Mm -hmm. There was technological treatises such as the Bellifortis of Conrad Chiesa or the De Machinis of Mariano Taccola or Valtorius books and so on. So um, another, another aspect, we made a video recently on Balkan heraldry, for example, and the heralds produced a lot, especially in this latter phase of the, the Middle Ages for reasons that, you know, if you know what heraldry is about, you know, you know why it happened. But again, because it was it was broadly speaking a system that was much more increasingly regulated, um, organized, framed. You know, the, the, it it was starting to be also much more hierarchical in nature. Um, so, so sometimes it's really an in, you understand how there was an enor that there is an enormous military library uh, from those times that from from the Middle Ages, as we were saying before, when organizing. Uh, and and that and, and and that up to the 18th century and beyond would have not done anything but growing, right? And surely, taking different directions, mostly low technology memorials, I we could say. And the, as you understand, it, it's so wide that it's difficult to interpret. But um, I, I presume there's been a kind of. Um, um, sort of reductionism towards them, saying, well, they're, they're not, they're a bit hypocritical, they're not really telling you the truth, it's all strange, we don't... Th this means failing to understand what they were written for, right? Um, because uh, most people cannot really separate the fact that writing something that is different from reality could actually be purposeful for reality. That's where, for example, theophobia stems from, in, you know, with secular, you know, the modernism, secularization, uh, and it's not a good service to, to civilization at all, right? Um, the, uh, for example, it's been said that the, you you don't have to leave yourself enchanted by, uh, by this, um, these episodes and and prescriptions inspired to loyalty, clemency, courtesy that you meet in this world because from one side there were uh, ethical literary topoi from the other side were a sort of you know class consciousness you know with all the uh, anti-classist meaning that you can attribute to it because classism is bullshit of course um, but let's say probably that we're stemming from an aristocratic background that uh, of course was um, of, was advising measure uh, towards, for example, th their own peers, right? But also in 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 different circumstances and different people, um, it was instead behaving in in a different manner. So it's been added that such that behind such illustrious example of courtesy, for for example, um, that made the the prisoner of rank treated almost as a as a as a guest, right? And and besides the the class recognition there was the adhesion to a mechanism of rents right the the prisoner was a capital and capital must be well cured right so as all the reductive maneuvers let's say this starts from undoubtedly from an objective base right what 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 is fallacious about this is the generalization the hypertrophization right when for example uh, Giovanni di Legnano by affirm or reaffirming the naturality and necessity right in the sen latin sense of necessitas bro that that w it's something it's not something deterministic it's something that realizes as we we're sh uh, saying short ago that the idea that you don't really have an option right there's a major divide from 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 modern mindset and um in in, in quantitatively speak so that's where it lays Right, it's not a definitive categorical statement. It's, it's literally, if you believe that you know war is is just a, an option that you can, that you will not never have to resume if you just don't want to. Like you're completely uh, alienated from reality. Um, we are too spoiled. That that's the problem. Um, and war. So it distinguished itself, for example, from the uh, fierce uh, 
struggle and without law of the and from the Latrocinium Grande of St. Augustine which which shows of course how far they had already gone at the time from the um, simple dichotomy between just and unjust war that's damned refinement why the modern mindset sees an hypocrisy behind that because we think we can reduce simplistic to monofactorial uh, uh, explanations things such as you know whether to make war or not um, these people were were already instead paving the path to the best um, uh, you know military historiographical I mean in th theoretical production right that would culminate in the in, with, with von Clausewitz um, centuries later so of centuries of great work and reflection right from problems that were much more present and direct and evident brought by war to, to our own right so was the dumb one here um, so d what uh, uh, it's not about whether war is just or unjust. It is how you have to concretely fight it if you end up in one. Right? Because you cannot really even predict that wh whether you will be invaded by somebody else or not. Right? And to them it was so evident, so such a concrete evidence that you, co you couldn't even at some point waste time whether, you know, that was just or unjust. After all, they already had a pretty sound moral point of reference, knowing that, of course, justice in this doesn't belong to this world, right? So, of course, you have to make the best you can. But um, there are certain things that are just uh, bigger than you, in ways that are not really a matter of power, but a matter of mathematical uh, complexity, right? It's not that if you are the a king of France or king of England in the 15th century, you are really, um, you're in charge of, you know, of, of everything, so whatever your country does, it's your fault. This is the other delusion sometimes we buy into, that there are tyrants that make things work all on their own and all the other people pay for it. It's the same myth of the butchers during World War I, in a sense, could refer to the military hierarchies. It's all this populistic nonsense that has emerged from a couple of centuries simply because the average person doesn't actually understand anything about the world and, uh, and distrusts radically any, anybody who is at the top. We can make mistakes, but it's still the person that knows best what, what the hell is going on and how to practically cope with that, not idealistically or abstractly, uh, as if there was no, no other thing to, to, to consider in, you know, waging war but the opinion of you know the guy you meet in the street right um, so the uh, it, it is just not to say that that is not important right in fact that must be considered as well but it, it just how do you calculate that how how can you calculate quantitative moral forces it's a, in, an incredibly um, uh, unstable equilibrium and today we live in much more mm, stable systems than before so imagine at the time Right. Uh, so, the what was important in this literary production is that they it didn't it wouldn't enter just in, within the cause of the wars, but also into their the way they were waged. Right. So, chivalry ethics from one side, law from the other, converged in a limitation that was at least formally there right for for the ferocity of of uh, of war right of, of of how this conflict would break out violent so as we were saying before they didn't have really much grip on how eventually things would be fought because again everybody knew you know m at the time more or less it was known that war was there and that independently from what people wrote in treatises they knew how to to wage it and it's some of the reasons why we don't have for example a lit much of a lit uh, at this time, actually, yes, because there were also men of war, noble men mo most of the times, who were really in charge, and because of their elevation, their hierarchical elevation, we're starting to see things in a much more clear way, scholarly, at the point of, let's, let's say, uh, as it had never been allowed before, because the, the, the dimension of police was too small, and, and at that point, 
It's not that they made war worse. Actually, they may even do it better. Um, but now the system was more complex, and so it needed more theory to guide it. So that's, that's why they emerged. But still, this man knew how to make war in 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 in, in, in ways that they wouldn't actually write in the treatises. Right? They would start in a while to do it, but it was still detached. Right? We, it's not just because. Um, Somebody wrote, I don't know, even great figures, think about Maurice of Orange, all, all, all these uh, first great, also theorists that were also successful generals uh, and changed uh, uh, military history and so on. But you don't have to think that literally everything they wrote had, you know, since they wrote that, they had a, a positive practical application. It's like the Burgundian battle plans that we were saying before. These were the same men who knew how to lead a medieval army, and we don't. Right, um, or at least we do, but only whether whether we are actual military men or maybe we understand something about military history from 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 a con very con better the art of war from a very concrete point of view. And after many 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 years spent studying it, and yet we wouldn't be able. That doesn't make us actually able to to lead them because direct experience is is, is superior. But. Um, they that it's exactly for this reason that we have to make the effort to understand why they would write such things which is again what we all hardly ever ask right and i can tell you that scholarly speaking the reason to my opinion such such an attention right the attention toward these books most of all is philological is literary is historical broadly meant uh it has like ah you know where did they took this information from etc but since there are hardly any uh, uh art of war historians uh all this falls to to nothing because it, 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 there is hardly anybody who can connect that to the practice of war it is already quite difficult to reconstruct given you know the times and places uh, for which we are actually very privileged, as in Western Europe, uh, but still they're normally unsatisfactory for what we would like to know concretely about the war of the time, largely and unfortunately. Um, so I it's obvious that such prescriptions and, and, and the found their justification in the fact that in reality things went different, right? You wouldn't write a a work or issue a law if if there wasn't a need to fix those things and so these works are very revealing about the fact that in part of course such uh, it's logical to think that such uh, prescriptions were disappointed right they were frustrated um, that then this is in in the concrete practice when we deal with the dialectics between a norm in reality right but we cannot really turn our head that from from the fact that sa from such norm theological juridical from one side ethical chivalric from the other different basis for the further regu international regulamentation of war began Right. This is the, the first, the ABC. It's like so many, you know, even sciences at the time. I mean, think of how modern science developed in these centuries. Oh, in uh, ahead with uh, with Galilei, with Newton, and it was a it was a process. It was a a step after the other, and it it, it cannot be, you know, th this thing had to happen sooner or later. But again, this doesn't mean that war was done in a less functional way than before and this is the same dialectical point we made if before nobody had really felt the need to actually explain for example how wars how battles were concretely fought from a doctrinal point of view and that they, they would concentrate just maybe on you know the, the inner you know things like sin etc from one side there is yes of course it was a more primitive time warfare was also on a smaller scale but at the same time there was a practicality of war that was absolutely dramatic, right? It requires uh, an intelligence and a, and, a, and a capacity that we are completely alien on average, uh, you know, massively at this point in history just because it's a product of mass society, um, that, uh, that they, they, they mastered in the sense that they, they 
like what would be the point of a for example i don't know a, of an 11th century knight to write down even if he had been able to write but find, finding somebody who would do that how war was fought given that there were so many knights all over the, uh, that knew how to fight and taught the new generations how to do it it was so such a widespread costume that why would why write in it right it's like oral tradition to written tradition it's not that people had to to somebody woke up one day to need to to write things down because they would forget they were already habituated to to remember everything right there were people in the middle ages who knew the bible by heart find a person today who knows the bible by heart they just can't right because we we are not we're different and and we have different needs and different capacities but they, they it, it would be natural and and it's difficult for us where 100 years ago we were more old that practically oriented today we we're, were more theoretically oriented to understand how important pure action was the focus of of all these cultures in a sense and how this action would translate itself in the, in the learning that the word in need of so again they made war in a very effective way right and we tend to kind of dismiss that when we think of ah you know but we we know better no you don't <laughs> right you, i i can assure you you don't right and what we can do is just very humbly very patiently uh and very thankfully read and very re with great reverence and respect and honesty and an open mindedness and open heartedness by the way read things that arrived to us that pa were passed down to us from such a long time ago to understand what those men and women were we living into right and that uh, i can assure you that history teaches you to to reflect in this sense before then expressing a judgment on on something that we understand this is a very a, a great modernistic bias right i'm not saying that um the world was necessarily well, was wasn't for example a beautiful place to live in at all there are many people today again that buy into tribalism and all this bullshit and they think that i don't know at the time that's where true people lived no it was we know it was a, a morally and materially miserable world but the connection that existed between the individual intelligence and capacity and the positive uh, applicability of of knowledge for the amount of that was needed to understand the world it's completely lost today by scale that is today we 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 may be you know we have a much more systematized and and mediated uh, um, educational forms but the result is is completely emptied of its substance that is we don't act anymore on them they're just empty categories and while the world is becoming ever more comp interestingly complex the individual capacity to to actually even think a broader solution like this this these authors were trying to, to think for their own time is completely lost right so either the elite become you know that are up to the task and really guide us you know the, the true you know places where you know we can dwell again and rise again as a, you know elevate the quality of the individual otherwise we are done for we are done for as a civilization because the, the lack of moral capacity is the, the single greatest threat in the in the process and don't think that um uh, it's it's um you know that there are interesting comparisons between the past and the present but just don't think that for example what happened in the 20th century is completely you know it's a chance it just happened because we got industrialized more powerful and you know and therefore we began to kill each other more industrially and systematically it's it's not just that right there is properly a detachment from reality from from those moral forces should be decisive not to do right in, in the middle ages you can f find you know uh, essentially a, a reality of a horror right some violence that would be unspeakable in a broader sense but you would be surprised by how this evil right and it, because there was you know was actually functional to that world right things that because we have different ethical standards of course but the reason why we have we are completely missing and and the way we the, in the moment would you know we, we will realize that is the only possible salvation for ourselves understanding why it was like that before and understanding why it is now 
and realizing how much we have fallen short of expectations after all, in spite of the development that in a sense humans are brought to to achieve in the first place, right, about themselves, right? If you let humans there, they're, they're building something. It's not, uh, you know, you don't have to give for granted that they wouldn't exterminate each other in the process, but let's say that's exactly the point. Uh, that relies on, on the on on how concrete that civilization ca can can deal with its own practical reality and and just knowing the difficulties of historical reconstruction well I'll tell you that most of the times we're not prone to recognize this in, in comparatively speaking um, so but this idea that you know the the international law was born through this and you can date it back to uh, to a long time before like there are people who have talked for example and even rightfully and of course anachronistically in terms maybe and that's why especially modernists contemporaryists uh, med we as medievalists we try not to fall in these traps but uh, it's quite common even for anticus reason like that to see for example in the development of the military class in the in the 10th century uh, and so the the birth of what we we we, we intend as chivalry is in a more or less approximate sense is is for example this class recognition the, the idea that no matter whether you were eastern frankish western frankish italic whatever you th there was a you know a sense of you know of 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 of, of status that ac was accompanied by a certain um, ethics because it, it together with it derived certain burdens and responsibilities and qualities that were required to that individual and so that there was kind of an internationality in that also because there was still an empire namely um, and, and, and certain public universalistic in fact uh, institutions that you had to live in a, in an international sense right and in medieval times actually even before then this the, the booming of this literary production there was a, a dramatically intensely developed um, international connection which is yet another thing that normally kids are not taught in school about the Middle Ages Middle Ages are dark nobody travels news doesn't arrive this is a completely uh, a completely uh, ir wrong there is no other way to, to, to it's a completely a complete misconception about m medieval history just if you know banally the the major events right at that point yeah you may not connect the dots but once you get into in depth you know how these states were all internationally interdependent there is no such thing like a country that existed in, in for the sake of itself uh, it was all about what the hell was happening around because they could be wiped out from a moment to another right no country could exist by itself just because and, and that's why these thoughts evidently began since an early age too to, because all the, 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 the things of the even the truces of God, the pieces of God and eventually crusading warfare, all this the the geographical dimension. When somebody could say, you know, prepare yourself to like the the, the, the goals do with Jerusalem when talking about the Baltic Crusades in reference to the French, well it you have there the the idea of a civilization that is able to conceive itself internationally. Right? That, and today just Banally speaking of history and geography, do, do children actually learn history and geography? Seriously? I mean, seriously. Not learning a bunch of, you know, lists by heart, but actually understanding the interconnections, right? even just at a simple level, for school level, but do they? Doesn't seem to me. The, the results are appalling. Most people do not know anything about, nor the countries they live, because there is no greatest lie of knowing anything about the country you live just because you're, you're born and raised there. You must study. Otherwise, you know nothing. And secondly, if you don't know anything about this, this, you know, the rest of the world, what you know about your country basically has no value whatsoever. It's completely irrelevant from any moral, scientific, or educational point of view because your country doesn't exist but in relation to the rest of the world. And that's why there are so many also political and strategical misconceptions such as okay, I will not name the, 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 the usual words that I, that I load, but um, probably a vision of the world that is, let's say, it, it's geopolit. It's it's the very concept of geopolitics that is, uh, you know, it, it's rigged uh, in 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 conceptual essence, at least in the way it's declined from a cultural point of view, right? Uh, considering history like football, 
um, you know, teams of between countries that score points one against the other, not realizing the dramatic fluidity and instability that still exists today in intertwinement and intersection at all political, social, cultural levels. And that is the only one from which a strategical humans can can rise. So if you think that if you're an expert in geopolitics, the, that gives you any kind of strategical uh, education, just know that the term itself is, is wrong. It does, it, it actually, it, it, it actually decreases dramatically the quality of any kind of strategical understanding for the same fact of using it and properly not understanding what's the problem with it. And I made a video about such things back in the day where I will make other videos about what's the, the deal with that. Um, well, in medieval times, they were surely also developing towards this more uh, evenly, you know, um, uh, identity na national. Um, uh, in fact, spotting like they 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 would start considering that country, that other country, but still it was, again, given the pressure that existed at the time, uh, still kind of extremely aware of what the world the world think was right and just study i mean if you i don't need to to make examples from inter the international policies i don't know the 14th to the 15th century to explain i don't know how the hundred years war the the council of Constance had a it was a, an all european business right and it, it and uh the, the great schism and so on so the be thankful, for example, as a European to live in a world where th there is no there is no war effectively from from eighty years almost um at least in the west right and because uh, sadly enough, this is not true elsewhere um in 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 other parts of the same europe Th think about um i don't know how lucky you are again, even as an American to be so safely after all in spite of you know terrorist attacks and so on but you know how how the, the stability and the deterrence that that you're provided with by living in your country you live in and so and and also the the enormous responsibility that you have still to have the capacity to, to be the only country that can wage war literally in every place of the globe right in what's the the enormous expectation that you have from international especially from 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 us in europe for that matter because that's how things should be, uh, and the privilege that you you have for us Europeans being uh, lazy of, as fuck, not paying our fair share in for for NATO, right? Where you 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 can compensate that by having you know troops in our countries to you know to shelter us, but also to you know to, to make leverage on us politically at some level. So um, this is um, a this is where everybody should start from, in my opinion, as as a as a healthy mind. But it's it's important to understand the roots of that. At the uh, at, at let's say at the thresholds of the modern era, we can see the affirmation of the feeling that theology, canonistics, ethic, um, let's say chivalric ethics were not satisfactory anymore by themselves right modernity is definitely not all bad right we, especially as military historians we should re reassess the the enormously positive part of it uh, the scientificity that started coming along with this recognition um the um the the, the obvious realization that no juridical meditation would have had sense if it hadn't been, for example, grafted on a system of effective powers, right? Like it, this was actually in the Middle Ages very clear already. Uh, in uh, for the scale of those uh, of those politics development, meaning that basically the world medieval law was based on the fact that. You could be a, a ruler only if you respected, for example, if you had the actual power to respect the, to to safeguard the, the rights of, of the communities, right? So what happened in the modern age is that this came less because, uh, the systems were becoming ever larger, a bit like today, and therefore there there had to be new systems, to maintain control, 
of this, and they had to be violent. They had, they had to use deterrence. They had to centralize. They need. They were states that needed more troops, larger armies, greater firepower. These things costed, and the communities had to understand that what was needed for them if they wanted to remain independent, right? And this naturally required a a greater scale in the development of international regulations as well, because the actors were becoming ever bigger in that regard, which before had, hadn't quite been in the same scale at least. And chivalric ethics this that had never been quite binding for anybody, right? Uh, and of course, now we will comment on it, but it appeared ever more disconnected from whatsoever social status, right? Even in there, chivalric ethics, we know that wasn't quite there, right? Um, knights never quite behaved like uh, chivalric literature had pretended they would have to, because as we've seen, that had been partly created exactly to regulate that lock of, uh, that actually that enclosing of, of knighthood, for example, in, within certain boundaries, at least to be organized in a certain sense, it was a process of, il of hierarchization uh, of elite. So the elite became ever more political rather than just military. And so it was understood that, at least from those people, was to be expected that capacity that would take consideration in a art more articulate way what, what had to be done, not to be done. Um, but the fact that the war was absolutely, you know, at least, you know, lo let's say there were things like admiration and hate, uh, loyalty and complete s lack of scruples, etc. But this, again, are normal. They're not a schizophrenic swinging that, you know, we can't just blame saying, ah, oh, this was chaos or anarchy. It wasn't. If you study those battles, just banally, you know, war has to be, f we know, uh, it as close of it since, war practically translates itself in wiping out physically your opponent, right? So uh, you you cannot, for example, quite uh, take prisoner a knight uh, uh, in, in uh, you know, uh, as, mm, and, and caring for his well-being and hoping for the ransom. And all, yes, that, that what, what mirrored even there did the, the ethical picture of the thing. If you don't first have a, a crushing cavalry charge in which people break their, their necks and, and die and, you know, transpass each other with lances, because otherwise you will never be able to take any prisoner. So the the the, the contradiction is, is just an illusion. As Just as it is an illusion to pretend today that, I don't know, pacifism is, is a better ideolo morally ideology than militarism. They're actually the worst extreme of the whole spectrum. Their pacifism is it was one of the single most radically violent and dangerous and threatening ideologies that has ever existed on the earth, as much as militarism. They're they're perfectly equivalent. There is nothing, uh, there's nothing to be proud as a human being to be a pacifist. And uh, and, and 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 in fact, all the, the the pacifist movements in history also you see not just recently, okay, but even historically in some real were used were used exactly sometimes by the same powers actually to to commit some of the greatest massacres in the history of mankind look at at buddhism with ashoka uh or you know just look at the the the, the post socialist paranoia that m doesn't make people study history because the history is terrible because there's war in it yes but your countries keep you know harassing and systematically you know um bitching and you know uh, behind this paranoia there's actually a passive aggressive fact uh behavior that that would escalate in violence as soon as things start going really wrong, as they unfortunately still kind of are. So um, uh, beware absolutely of these delusions, because they are dangerous ideologies designed exactly to instrumentalize people for, for violent purposes that very often do not have a, a, you know, a civic conscience, a democratic... Uh, uh, culture behind them, but just, you know, just power grabbing, and, and that's pretty much it. Not that that doesn't actually develop also certain higher standards, right? But it's the, 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 the absolute, <laughs> you know, s simplism and uh, naivety and, and actually anti-scientific nature of, of such ideologies that are 
that are appallingly bought by, by people that always are the direct responsibles for, for, for any regime they, they, they are under at every given second for everything they do. And the, uh, we had, uh, at, say, at, at the time, in modern history, there was now a need to focus and regulate as quickly as possible on the base of that use gentium that was necessary in function of the absolute states at that point because they were the only ones capable of providing the, the, the control on those systems. Questions that were quite, quite heavy, such as piracy, we made a video last summer, reprisals we have found them as we have seen also in the 15th century already in the in Giovanni di Legnano for example the uh, rights of the of the neutrals or those who do not quite take side um, which um, would deserve another important digression uh, meaning that uh, again participating towards not such like you you can be as responsible actually for not participating to a war than than not do and this is evident in any political bio, uh, balance the rights of the unarmed of the defenseless right of the innocence if you prefer and the one of the prisoners so we are really in the modern age when for example uh, francisco suarez um, stated that humanity was complexively and beyond the division in states um, that was surely legitimate but that was born not by nature but the consensus of men which is an accurate depiction um, kept uh, in, at least in practice because that's what makes effectively certain political allegiances was kept to the natural precepts of charity and reciprocal uh, help right and in general just naturalism allowed the organic deepening of such principles for example to which for example the i don't know the the jure belli ac pacis of um hugus grotius published in 1625 contributed to give a uh, systematization that has become was product of its time uh, a classical right uh, given that the Netherlands in the in the in the early 17th century are not really a, a random country in this this account and and that took into consideration of course the uh, th th that is at the base essentially of, of our international law at least it's a milestone in the scale of development of the same thus um, international law that is born with the consensus of all the states uh, at least of the Western Christian ones uh, uh, at the time, it was um, self-representing itself as inspired to divine law and to nature. They were actually the same thing, um, uh, philosophically and scientifically, and hence also the very mm, poem, you know, mm, very meticulous regulamentation of war that found expression in say our days in the in the various Geneva conventions from you know 1864 1906 1929 1949 this is important for for a number of reasons because it, it makes you see the scale of the uh, the same military power augmenting right what before required the a census of all I don't know the nobility, the representatives of the land, right? And how still in modern democracies fundamentally you need that 50% plus one uh, in theory at least to elect then eventually uh, by governing. And functionally we don't live in, in a regime of direct democracy because that that would be uh, awful because there wouldn't be any kind of negotiation. But fundamentally the same states operate uh, collegially right in, with international communities we we are you know still i mean in historical perspective probably in infancy in the way that we are we're dealing with international affairs we're also in a in a moment where in spite of the of globalization we are shrinking a bit in in um 
in, in properly in debtor and power, both in absolute and in relative terms, because of economical crisis, but also because of the rise of different actors on the international scene, and that is not a good formula for, let's say, um, for 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 peace actually, but I it is if that can be a, you know, a consolation, of course, for further international regulation. It's as if we were at this point exactly like in the 14th century, right, or in the 15th century. There are many analogies with that. Um, and that the contractors here are the same states. And and also that this could be seen uh, quite evidently in, in, let's say, in the concreteness of political and thus of military power. It's, it's just the great economical regimes. Uh, you can impose a certain economical system to a country. Think about the, the blocks during the Cold War that were all but blocks actually, but you know, ask Yugoslavia or, or Sweden what, what they were actually and, and, and many other areas where naturally things switched along the way. But um, the, um, um, uh, let's say, I don't know, like a, a communist regime uh, economically wise for 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 a for a single country had to cope, for example, with being in a free market in 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 the world, right? It could be a socialist at home, but uh, you know, in international policy, you were a capitalist because that's how simply the natural state. Of, so, I mean, capitalism and socialism fully are never achievable per se. There's always something in between, but fundamentally, it's you know. Reality is much more shifted in favor, at least of what we think it's capitalism, um, in or at least that what we come to mitigate the the shortcomings, you know, the the the, the unpredictabilities, uh, the the difficulties of the market, etc., has a had as a dimension that still is competitive, right, and looks at the improvement of the of the of the life quality through free. In fact, free market and free exchange, etc., and that is a very aggressive field, right? And you can try to internationally regulate, but you have to cope with the internet uh, to 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 nationally uh, regulate. But you can't uh, you can't quite uh, you have to be aware there is a world out there, right? Uh, outer key doesn't work anymore, right? And this is in fact also one of the fortunately one of the reasons for which we, in spite of the instability of, of human communities in general, we, uh, through globalization, we, we have, at least given such trends, ever less reason to fight each other. For many reasons, there are of general profit for, um, but also, if we were to reason just military speaking, because basically no country in the world today is uh, autonomous in terms of military capacity, right? And, uh, and war has become so expansive and but so destructive in potential that uh, it, it's a tool that we have to mediate quite carefully and that is going to bring to a sort of further integration like it had in fact brought in 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 the modern age if you see the development of firearms even though by itself is just uh, an absolutely unsatisfactory uh, element for the compaction of the modern state contrary wise to, to what the theorists of these military revolution think well that is um, uh, that is that was a, at least a consequence or a cause at the same time of the the need of political compaction of certain realities that up to the previous centuries we have said we don't want to be unified in a single country under a single ruler but uh, given that you know that there are others that are threatening us ever more right the idea of political cohesion and therefore of extension also on the var um, um, uh, on a larger amount of communities and so on territories and so on of such authorities are the you know are necessary what's for, for survival and to build something stronger we can eventually profit from right so these are all other considerations but um, this is it so we will keep talking about this topic naturally for now I just I stop it here. Just hope that you enjoyed this video. If you did, please share it. Otherwise, leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming content. And for now, I thank you heartily for listening to me. I wish you a nice time and see you next time.